Buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Eh, hoy tenemos eh, la oportunidad en Casa Árabe de, eh, de asistir a la conferencia eh, Coleccionar y Comisariar Arte Islámico en el siglo XXI. Eh, participan en la conferencia eh, Tim Stanley, que es comisario jefe de Oriente Medio en el Victorian Albert Museum, que ya tuvo ocasión de estar aquí con nosotros hace aproximadamente año y medio, con ocasión del premio Yamil, Santiago Saavedra, director de Ediciones El Viso, y Guillermo de Osma, historiador del arte y galerista, que también estuvo con nosotros recientemente en la velada, digamos así, que dedicamos a Mariano Fortuny, hijo, Mariano Fortuny y Madrazo. Eh, el eh, punto, o el, el origen de esta, eh, de esta conferencia es, eh, entiendo yo, la necesidad que tenemos aquí en, en Casa Árabe de contribuir precisamente a, a hacer visibles una serie de tendencias muy importantes en relación, por un lado, con el mundo árabe y en relación con eh, también aspectos concretos del arte eh, islámico. Curiosamente, el arte siempre es islámico y una de las principales lenguas es el árabe. Y es arte islámico porque eh, las aportaciones de países eh, como Turquía, eh, como Irán, como India y Pakistán, y como no, el caso nuestro de, de España, de Al-Ándalus, son fundamentales para ese arte. Eh, hay varias eh, exposiciones... Eh, circulando recientemente. Hay una exposición inaugurada hace eh, 15 días, 10 días, en Sevilla, en los Venerables, en, en, la, en la Fundación Focus Avengoa, denominada NUR. En, en Londres, hay, recientemente, se inauguró The Everlast, eh, Everlasting Flame sobre el arte eh, ligado, ligado a al zoroastrismo y hay muchas exposiciones que están poniendo en diferente valor, no solamente en el caso del zoroastrismo, no es arte islámico como tal, pero el arte del Oriente Medio y de las zonas de influencia. Pero existen muchas más tendencias, hay eh, a diferentes niveles, existe eh, todo el intento de eh, por parte de los países del Golfo de eh, apoyar su industria cultural y su construcción nacional también mediante ejercicios como puede ser la creación del Museo de Arte Islámico de Doha o como puede ser eh, las diferentes actividades en Abu Dhabi, Dubai, la potencia cada vez mayor de Oman y una serie de países, el, evidentemente el más importante a todos los efectos siempre es Arabia Saudí, hay otros fenómenos también, como la mayor importancia de, precisamente de compañías como pueden ser Christie's y Socebis, eh, incidiendo cada vez más en este tipo de mercado. Eh, y hay, insisto, infinidad de cuestiones y de temas que están sobre la mesa y que yo creo que la aportación de, de los tres ponentes puede ser eh, de eh, especial Importancia. Cada uno de ellos eh, proviene de, de un mundo y ambos son todos ellos son complementarios. Eh, pero sin más, voy a dejar la palabra ya a Tim Stanley, que será quien ocupe la mayor parte del tiempo y posteriormente Santiago Saavedra como editor y Guillermo de, Os de Osma como galerista eh, podrán hacer el contrapunto y los elementos que ellos quieran destacar. Muchas gracias. Tim. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk here at the Casa Árabe this evening. And uh, I hope what I uh, say has some relevance to um, the audience here. I think that the, because the subject I, is my, my daily work, but I do, do think that it has some uh, significance uh, within the world of museums, but also within a, a broader uh, issues about Um, civil culture and the way that um, people are use museums to construct identities. So the, the origins of what I'm going to say this evening go back to a conference um, that happened in the L Musée du Louvre in Paris uh, in May 2004. Uh, what had happened was that the curators at the Louvre noticed that in the... Um, 
previous couple of years, quite a significant number of developments had been announced. One of them was the creation of a new Museum of Islamic Art in Doha and Qatar, um, but there were also renewals of, uh, of galleries or museums which were taking part in many parts of the world. So that, for example, the, Co the um, David collection in Copenhagen, which is the most significant collection of Islamic art in Scandinavia, had announced that it was going to be redeveloped. The, the whole, all the galleries, including the most important part, which is the Islamic collection. The V&A, where I work, had announced um, in 2003 that it was going to redevelop the um, main Is Islamic Middle East gallery in the museum. The Metropolitan Museum in 2002 closed its Islamic galleries and announced that there would be that it would be a, rede a redevelopment, um, which has since opened. So the the Louvre, the V&A, the Metropolitan Museum, the, the David Collection, also the, um, uh, the Benaki Museum in Athens uh, had decided during the redevelopment of its main building to move the Islamic uh, collection, which is a very significant one, to a new Museum of Islamic Art in the Kiramikos district of Athens into a, a 19th century villa um, that had been given to the museum. And all of these... Um, were discussed at the 2004 exhibition. And I think that the, there was a sort of public expectation that there would, we would find a single cause behind the, the, behind the fact that all these different institutions had decided to um, recreate, their, either create or recreate their displays of Islamic art. And one of the findings of the, of the conference was that in fact that wasn't the case. That in, in, rather surprisingly, in, despite the fact that we were in the wake of 9/11, uh, um, in, in only four years before, in 2000, three years before, in 2001, um, the, it was the individual um, museum's history which actually told you about it. Like the decision that was made by Baden, the Benaki went back many years. Uh, the v and decision was based on the fact that we had the finance made available to us by the Jamil family. The Met had closed its Islamic galleries because it needed to rebuild the gallery underneath for the display of classical art. In each, the Louvre um, had made a political decision to expand its, um, its Islamic displays, but those were linked to the uh, the changes of policy within the French state, because unlike the V&A, which is not, which is funded by the state but not directed by it, the the museum system in France is still very much under the control of um, the political system. So that it was Jacques Chirac who decided that the um, the music, the galleries in the Louvre should be developed, redeveloped. After the first stage of that was to create a new department of the arts of Islam within the Louvre, and then to get the funding for the, the new gallery. So you can see that the, the, there was something which is not in, maybe not entirely disconnected from the crisis that occurred um, in uh, Western culture about the year 2001. Um, but they were, they, it reflected the individual fates of um, the museums in question. And of course, the, one of the new things was the new interest in Islamic art in the Gulf. And that this was the first stage of this in terms of, was the, uh, the creation of a new museum of Islamic art in Qatar that would be um, uh, in a sort of uh, high profile uh, building which was created by a very famous international architect, I.M. Pei. Um, and ev even there you can see that, that this is part of a cont continuity because the Kuwaitis had already created a similar institution which was uh, more or less destroyed at the time of the Iraqi invasion in 1991. But there, there, was, there is something going on there in the Gulf. But what I think brings the common thing about it was, it was there was an important change of identity that was going on, and there was a new high profile. So it wasn't so much that the causes of the individual redevelopments were, came from a single source, but the perception of them 
by um, journalism, journalists and the general public was that there must be something going on behind it. And that was about the, the feeling that Islamic art had become more important. It had, it had got a much higher uh, profile rather than being a backwater of the, the study of, of art from different parts of the world. So that Im new importance for it actually was, was placed onto these new redevelopments and it, was, it gave them a significance which is um, connected to uh, the, the search for new identities for um, people in the Middle East. But we, that identity is now sort of crystallizing around the term Islamic art. But we have to remember that that term in itself was, is not something invented in the Middle East. It was invented in Europe. It first comes into use about the year 1900. And what it, um, what it reflected was a change in the way that uh, Europeans dealt with the art of that particular part of the world. In the middle of the 19th century, people began to use ter general terms for the art of the, um, of the Middle East and of South Asia. And this was part of um, uh, a sort of uh, part of a general process of creating categories into which you can cut the world up and deal with it in easy terms. It's, um, and at first, the, for example, in the Grammar of Ornament, which was published in 1856, for example, the primacy was given to the term Arabian art and other terms such as Indian art, uh, Moorish art, meaning the art of um, Morocco and Spain, um, Turkish art, and in, um, have I said Indian? Anyway, there, there, you can see that all of those sort of things which are slightly more to do with the geographic area were actually subsumed under Arabian art because uh, Owen Jones, who wrote the um, the Grammar of Ornaments text compiled to the book, he was trying to work out a system which enabled us to understand the art, the art produced in all those countries, which he saw as connected. And he saw the main event being the Arab conquest in the seventh century as creating a new geographical uh, zone within which these artistic developments took place. Later on in the um, century, it became more conventional to refer to Arabian art and Persian art and think of them as two separate uh, uh, sets of artistic production. And then towards the end of the century, it became um, normal to talk about, for example, uh, musulman, in l'art musulman, or Mohammedan art. Um, and then finally, around 1900, F.R. Martin the Swedish um, specialist, uh, came up with the term Islamic art, and that's the one that achieved uh, currency gradually over the 20th century. So this is something that's invented in Europe. Um, but what's happened is that um, the political developments and the, uh, econ I, I, the sort of um, wider economic developments in the Middle East have meant that this term has acquired a currency within the region itself. When the, um, uh, un, in, in the 20th century, there was a museum set up in Cairo, for example, which was called the Museum of Arab Art. Uh, there were, it was perfectly okay earlier in the 20th century to talk about Arab art as a separate um, set of artistic production and architectural production from Islamic art, which was more popular, becoming more popular in the West. This was, this was sort of fitted in with the political system of the period, which was dominated by Arab nationalists. In the broader um, terms, we've, we've seen in the last decades the fa what, what's seen generally is the failure of Arab nationalism and its replacement by forms of Islamism. And of course, that means that in the Middle East itself, uh, the idea of Islamic art becomes more acceptable it becomes the, and, it, and I have to say that it has it within it something which is sort of um, strategically useful to collectors in the Arab world. That if you call it Arabian art, the Arab world was very productive in terms of innovation and uh, major centers of production up until the, Arab, the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluk Empire in 1517. Since 1517, the major centers of innovation and um, 
uh, stylistic uh, development have actually taken place outside the Arab world in the centers of, the, of Iran, in Central Asia, and in uh, the Ottoman capital of Istanbul. So that period after 1517, there's a great deal of very attractive art produced in the Middle East, um, which if you call your category Arab art, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to collect it. Whereas if you have a, collect, uh, a term which is Islamic art, that means you can collect the whole region for the whole period from the 7th century up until the 19th or 20th century. Um, and from the, the European point of view, Islamic art is also useful because we have to develop, if in terms of creating uh, university courses, but also in terms of arranging museums, we have to divide the world into pretty, uh, pretty large blocks. And if we have um, useful terms that cover large numbers of small countries, those are very useful. I mean, the terms like Africa, for example, we, we think they, they, um, they're natural because we always, we're brought up with this uh, of understanding the geography of the world in these, these, these constructed terms, like Africa, that then become very useful for museums. So we have an area called African art within the museum. Um, the same is for, I mean, China is a, is a country, but it's so large that it, it maintains a system of its own within, within this division of the world. Um, but for the areas um, of South Asia and the Middle East, it, it's become conventional to use this term Islamic art. So you can see that the term has both in the region itself and in the areas which produced it, a usefulness in terms of being a tidy way of, of um, uh, putting everything together. But you can see that the, um, within this um, broad um, sort of pattern of dividing the world into, into, different, uh, into areas which we call by different names, we have um, an area which, when people began to use the term Islamic art, for example, at the V&A, the first gallery for Islamic art was opened in 1950. Uh, but at that time, much of the, the, the Middle East was still dominated by Britain and um, by France. And uh, by, uh, so there were areas which were independent already, but it was an area which was relatively submissive to Europe in terms of politics. And it, and it was an area that was becoming important because of um, issues such as you know, the oil and uh, transit of trade through the, the Suez Canal. Um, but it was of, a, a seen as a relatively low level um, a priority, uh, which may have changed a bit after the Suez crisis. But the, um, the overall uh, level of which people gave importance to it was relatively limited. And it was really, in, in terms of my own museum, it was quite lucky that when in the 19th century, the museum had bought a very large carpet, the Ardebil carpet. Um, the, the Ardebil carpet is, was, uh, is 10 and a half meters long and about five meters wide. And they had created at that time a, sp a specific space for that carpet within the museum because the, in the, the museum was, the carpet was acquired in 1893 and the museum was at that point being redesigned so that a very large uh, group of buildings, of, of galleries, were built along the front of the building. And they actually designed part, one of those galleries to be wide enough to put the Ardebil carpet on the wall. And so the Ardebil carpet ended up in a gallery very near the front of the museum and when, we, um, when the museum came to change the way it displayed its uh, collections so that they created an Islamic art gallery in the late 1940s, they left the Ardebil carpet where it was because that's where you, you, they, um, it would be foolish to try and insert it in any, any other part of the building. And so in the, in the 2000s, when we came to rede redevelop the Islamic gallery, it was already, it was, we already knew where it was going to be in a location that was very near the main entrance to the building. It has a certain prominence. That prominence in 2006, when we opened the gallery, seemed to be entirely justified because Islamic art had become that much more important. But of course, that was the result of the, um, the prominence of the increasing prominence of the Middle East in, the, uh, in, in world politics in that period after 1950 when the gallery was first developed as an Islamic art gallery. 
And so those, we have, you know, what I'm saying is that there's an is issue of um, each institution has its own history and it, um, it works with the collections it, it uh, has from the past and tries to build on them now. But at the same time, external forces are giving new prominence to certain parts of the collection. And we can see that the, um, the term Islamic art um, was, in, was perhaps invented by Martin or someone else uh, more than just over 100 years ago, but it has become very useful to a, a large number of people. And we can see also that this term has been adopted by the richest group of people within the Middle East who are the rulers of the Gulf states. So, we, as I mentioned, um, there was first a... Uh, a, a, a museum of Islamic art in Kuwait. Now there's a very impressive museum of, of Islamic art in Qatar. And we can see that, the, um, th that they've, they've taken on this as providing themselves in states which had not had a very rich uh, cultural tradition themselves because they had very small populations who were relatively poor. Uh, they're able to build, using this term, a, a, an Islamic framework or for the culture of the past, which they can uh, present both to the world and to their own populations as something which belongs to them. And we can also see that they're using um, the uh, creation of museums as part of a strategy in, to create activity, economic and uh, other activities within their states. And for ex the, the big case is in the example of the, um, of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, which is the richest of the United Arab Emirates. And there they're creating the Museum Island, where they're creating a series of museums, at the same time making residential and um, economic investments in the same area, because they see the museums as something for people to come from outside and visit Abu Dhabi. Uh, and uh, as, So they're creating a tourism industry by creating museums for people to go and visit, at the same time as them doing other activities, such as shopping and sunbathing. Um, and we can see that uh, would be something, we, we know from our experience that that's something that interests the, uh, the government in Dubai as, as well, because Dubai is a big um, center for uh, all sorts of financial and other services, rather than for the um, oil um, wealth that you have in Abu Dhabi. They get their wealth from um, being a trading center and a, uh, a center of exchange in lots of different ways. This means they have a very large expatriate population, and there they're seeking to create um, mu um, a sort of museum sector and other types of activities in order to provide a, um, a sense of uh, cultural complexity in a place uh, which has been so far dev devoted mainly to uh, commercial activities. And that makes it a more attractive place for people to come and live. So we can, you can see that museums, uh, in this case, not, are not only about creating something um, which is about identity, but it also is seen as something as advantageous as many other cultural industries are uh, to creating a, a context for other activities and to generating themselves um, things for people to do and to make their lives more interesting and make the place more attractive. Um, we, there, I think we're in a sort of a stage where there has been a lot of criticism of the terms that we use about uh, the, uh, the Middle East and Islamic art because it's seen as these terms are Eurocentric and they've been created in Europe and foisted on them. But I think, I mean, one, the example for the Middle East, I, I, I was in the, in the V&A, we don't actually have an Islamic art section because we have a very long tradition, a tradition that's older than the museum itself, of collecting the art and design of South Asia. And therefore, when the museum um, was reorganized in the early 20th century, they created an Indian section, which covered both the Islamic and non-Islamic traditions of South Asia. But of course, at that point, it's called India. Eventually, we changed the name of that, that to South Asia, but at the same time, they created a section which covered Southwest Asia and North Africa. And we needed to find a name for that. So whereas in the Far East, 
section and the Indian section have been renamed East Asia and South Asia, we've not been able to find any term that is meaningful but is, all, is understood by the, pack, the, 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 the public, which is the Middle East. We could extend it to the Middle East and North Africa. Even, so we continue to use a term which is completely Eurocentric in the sense that it's, it's only the East if you're in Europe, um, but it is something which is used in um, everyday conversation and in uh, publications both of general and specialist kind to refer to this region. And so I was, I was actually trying to think to myself how I can explain this to um, other people. And it occurred to me that, that because for us in Britain, the term Middle East is slightly problematic because it's American. That in the past, in, especially before the First World War, in Britain we thought of the Near East as being the eastern end of the Mediterranean, and then the Middle East was further, further east. And so we had the Near and Middle East, and this was shared by um, lang other languages uh, in Europe and elsewhere. For example, in Russia, you still to refer to the Near and Middle East. And it occurred to me that what had happened was that the, the Near East was the area to which British people went uh, in the 18th and 19th century by ship. So you went through the Mediterranean. The Middle East was the region which you went to from the Indian Ocean. And when the move from uh, British domination to American domination took place after the Second World War, things had changed and people now, need, now use uh, aircraft to get there rather than ships. And so this division between the Near and Middle East didn't make sense to the Americans, so they just started to call it the Middle East. But I think that I'm, I'm showing you that it's actually people from outside the region who are making the decisions. And I think that what's happening is that the terms that are being used uh, are being, have been appropriated by the people in the region itself. And that while there's a sort of left-wing criticism, uh, academic criticism of the use of these terms, actually they're being, these terms are being turned on their head. That maybe F.R. Martin did... Uh, invent the term Islamic art, or it's certainly he's the first person to use it in a text. But Islamic art is now being used by people in the Gulf especially, but also, for example, the, the, the new Museum of Islamic Art in Cairo, which used to be the Museum of Arab Art. There's a Museum of Islamic Art in, um, in uh, Tehran. And even in Turkey, with, under the current uh, government of the uh, AK Party, which is Islamist, Everything to do with the Ottoman past and with the Islamic inheritance of Tur heritage of Turkey is being given a higher profile, and therefore the term Islamic art is even becoming acceptable in what was previously a very nationalist country where what we call Islamic art of Ottoman Turkey was called Turkish art. And so um, I think that this, there's a new um, uh, interest in, the, uh, in these terms in the Middle East and that they're actually using the terms um, to mean the things that they want to say rather than being entirely dependent on uh, what's being said outside the region. Although that hasn't been fully achieved, I think it's certainly going that way. And um, the, 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 one of the great things is that um, collections are being made in the uh, Middle East and also by people of Middle Eastern origin elsewhere, which is actually understand, which is changing the understanding of what Islamic art is. Because when I look at the collection of my own museum, which is one of uh, the greatest in the world, um, it does have elements which are connected to the art of calligraphy, for example. But in the 19th century, they, they were collecting Islamic art in order for it to be a model for British design. And therefore, calligraphy is of no use at all if you're a British designer, unless you're making something specifically for the Middle Eastern market. And therefore, they weren't, that, they weren't systematically collecting calligraphy. The, call, the calligraphic element in the collection was brought in by, the, um, by chance, by, for example, choosing something because it was an interesting technique. Whereas the collections that have been begun in recent years, including the ones in the Gulf, um, show a much broader understanding of Islamic art and they incorporate art forms and give them prominence in a way that wasn't the case in the collections that were made um, outside the, the Middle East and South Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
So maybe I should finish there and we can... So what, I'm, what I, I'm presenting is that uh, the issues around Islamic art uh, and its presentation in the 19th century have a certain political context and that that context is changing as the balance of power changes in the world. Gracias. Eh, Santiago Saavedra eh, es, es un editor, ha estado muchos años dedicado y sigue estando intensamente a cuestiones relativas a, a la edición de arte, no solamente evidentemente en, en España y en Oriente Medio, sino en, en México y en bastantes otros países. Así que espero que nos dé una visión sobre, eh, digamos, eh, la interconexión, por así decirlo, entre edición, exposición, eh, comisariado y, y relaciones con, eh, también con los grandes museos. Sí, hola, buenas tardes. Eh, primero quería preguntarle a, a Tim, que ha explicado muy bien un poco la evolución del concepto de arte islámico. Vamos a esperar que me... Sí. Sí. Um, ¿lo, ¿Lo puedes oír, Tim? Sí. A ver, seguimos probando. Por fin. Ya. Muy bien. Bueno, eh, Tim, decía que después de la explicación clara que nos has dado de la evolución del concepto de arte islámico, te quería preguntar con qué te parece la medio polémica o discusión que hubo a un momento dado sobre si el término arte islámico, que está basado en el Islam, que es una religión, eh, era aceptable o no aplicarlo para todas las artes que se desarrollaron en el territorio eh, de arte islámico. Igual que no había un arte cristiano, nunca se ha utilizado el término general de arte cristiano, puesto que había el arte románico, había, en fin, pues se planteó, creo, un momento dado, la misma discusión sobre si era adecuado o no utilizar como único término el de arte islámico para expresar eh, toda esa amplia gama de manifestaciones artísticas. ¿no? Y del mismo modo que últimamente en la renovación de las galerías islámicas del Metropolitan no las llaman galerías de arte islámico, sino que han buscado una combinación muy larga de decir eh, arte del... Eh, el este arte de Irán, arte del lejano. Altikama. Por ejemplo. Altikama. Altikama. Arab lands, Turkey, Iran and Central Asia. Al sí, con lo cual uh, complicado. Right. Oh, and later South Asia. That's Sorry. it. That's it. That's Sorry. it. ¿Eh? Entonces quería saber un poco qué opina de esta controversia que hubo un momento dado, que creo que incluso re se reunieron directores de museos importantes del mundo para opinar eh, sobre este tema. Sí, bueno, es una pregunta muy interesante. Solo para tomarlo, porque es confuso escuchar a ustedes. I'm um, sorry, I'm, yes. I think we can start with the Metropolitan Museum example of Alti Khalsa. And I was saying earlier that the, um, th there was a, a usefulness of the term uh, Islamic art in the Arab world, and that it's acceptable, and it's become increasingly acceptable as uh, more regimes um, present themselves not as uh, Arab nationalists, but as uh, Islamist. And the issue, though, is that I described how in Iran there's now um, what, used to, what used to be part of the Museum of Ancient Iran is now the Museum of Islamic Art, and that the, the term Islamic Art is becoming more uh, used in Turkey in a more respectful way. But, of course, in America, you have large numbers of people who left Iran uh, because of the Islamic Revolution. Um, I can give you an example that um, uh, Monir Farman Farmoyan, who's a, a considerable artist, uh, I, when the, she did the installation of contemporary art, uh, which was on when we opened the uh, Islamic Gallery uh, 
at the V&A, I should say the Islamic Middle East Gallery at the V&A, and um, I took her round the next day, and she remarked on this very beautiful carved stone basin that we have. So I said to her, yes, it's from Syria. And she said, what's it doing here? Because for her, with the Ardebil carpet in the middle of the room, this was a gallery of Iranian art. That people who live outside the Iran, the people who migrated out, and in fact, um, uh, Munir lives in Tehran, as, as she's gone back now, but they come from, their background is from the days of the Pahlavi monarchy in Iran, and for a strong sense, and you know, largely justified sense, of pride in the artistic uh, greatness of Iran in the past. So for them, subsuming Iranian art in uh, Islamic art is, is not acceptable. And it's the same for the Turkish funders. Uh, so the, the, the Iranian funders of the Met Galleries didn't want it to be called Islamic art. And the same is true, I think, for the Turkish funders. And so we see it's actually the exception proves the rule that um, Islamic art has become a political football um, which is acceptable in most places, but there are some people for it isn't. Now, of course, what I've just told you, I cannot give you documentary proof of, but it's the only way of understanding the galleries. Because when you go into the... The, um, the Met, if you went in soon after the galleries were opened, the, 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 um, the guardians, you know, the, the warders who are around the entrance and take your tick, your, make sure you've paid, um, they were very excited. I mean, it's one of the nice things about the Met is that the, all the staff take the place very seriously because it's a very prestigious place to work. And so they were, t they were telling me as I went up the steps anonymously, not as a curator of Islamic art, but just as Joe Public, they were telling me to go and visit the Islamic galleries because they're new and they're wonderful. So then I went upstairs and I went into the, to the Alti Khalsa galleries, the arts of all these different places. And I went into the introductory room and the introductory room texts are an introduction to Islamic art. So I'm saying that they worked out a display in many rooms of a great collection of Islamic art, and then something else forced them to change the name, and it seems to me that my explanation is the most likely. So the issue about um, whether you can call all of uh, the production of the Middle East and South Asia and other regions from the seventh century to now, whether you can call that Islamic art, that is something that I think, um, you know, is, it's, a, it's a, an objection that I understand because my training is actually not as an art historian, it's as a historian. And in my uh, postgraduate work, I worked on the history of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the, his the Ottoman Empire lasted from the late 13th century until 1922. That is an enormous amount of time. It covered uh, at least half of what we call the Middle East for almost all of that period. Well, it gradually, and by, after 1517, it covered an enormous part of the Middle East. It, the Ottoman Empire is a category that is large enough and complex enough to sustain research on it without any reference to anything broader. So I considered myself an Ottoman historian, but um, maybe I wasn't so successful as an Ottoman historian because then I, when I tried to get a job, I ended up working in the field of Islamic art. And so I had to come to terms as someone who'd never heard of the term Islamic history except as an undergraduate course by, and it referred to the early period of, of Islam. Um, I was taught by Bosworth, uh, uh, Edmund Bosworth, who's a, a great figure in the study of Islamic history, but that went from the seventh century and faded out in the 10th century. So that's the category I'd, I was used to. And so I had to come to terms with this broad character, ca category of Islamic art. But, and I've always, at first I thought I was, I was just having to do it because that's what everybody had called it. But over time I did actually begin to understand something, which is people object to it because they said, you've got a gallery of Islamic art, but you haven't got a cat cat gallery of Christian art. And I would, I, my, you can see this in the text for the Jamil Gallery at, at the V&A, that my idea was that the, which I didn't work out on my own, but I mean, I wrote the actual text in the end, um, that all of us who were working on it understood that there's a big difference between Christianity and Islam. And that is that when um, 
Christianity was formed, it was the it was the it was the religion of first of all a small minority in a remote province of the Roman Empire, and then it changed to being a mass movement of the dispossessed. And it's only in the fourth century when Constantine sees it as politically expedient and makes uh, Christianity the official religion of the of the uh, Roman Empire that Christianity ch starts to change into an official religion, and um, I th that is different from what happened in Islam. Islam begins as th with the migration of the Prophet Muhammad and his followers from Mecca to Medina in six three. Oh no, I can't remember now. Six two two. What am I saying? Of course, I know that date. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they got to Medina. Yathrib, as it was called then, they formed, this is when they, they crystallized as a separate religious community. But they were living in a town where, where other people were Jewish, and so there, and where there was no imperial or royal authority. So Muhammad became the religious and political leader. So Islam, from the time of the Prophet, develop, developed as a polity as well as developing as a religion. And therefore, after the Prophet's death, um, the, the nature of that polity was changed by the great conquests which were undertaken under the first caliphs, and it became a great empire, an Islamic empire. And so the, the, the ruling state in the Middle East from that point onwards until the, the colonial period had as its ideology, all of, all of the, first of all there was one state, then there were many, but they all had as their ideology the, 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 the political system that they'd inherited from the first Muslims. And that's why Islamic means something more than Christian does, because it, although there are in um, many countries Christ, avowedly Christian politicians and political parties, and Christianity is the official um, uh, religion of the state, it's not quite the same as it is in the Islamic world, where you have Islam built into the political system from the beginning. But then, it also occurred to me, and I hope I'm not giving far, far too long an answer to this question, it also occurred to me that something, we were misjudging ourselves. That we think that we've always been Europeans. But of course we weren't. In the Middle Ages, we called ourselves in, in Europe, except for, you know, we used the term Christendom. And so when I look at the European galleries at the v and I'm looking at the art of Christendom until you get fairly late, you know, into the Enlightenment. And what happened was that I think, I, my original formula was Christendom plus the French Revolution equals Europe, um, but then th this, this came into my head. I'm sure that lots of other people have said this before, so I, I don't think it's an original thought, but it does, it does occur to me recently, I, I, ref I was reading an early 18th century Italian source on the Ottoman army, and he was saying what we do in Europa, so I understood that actually in the early 18th century, uh, people were already referring to us as Europe. And so I see it more as, maybe it's more to do with the Enlightenment and um, the, uh, there's something happens in European society uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, which means that we no longer identified us, this uh, continent we live on, as Christendom, but we changed to calling it Europe. So that hasn't happened in the Middle East. So if we think of the, although we call it European art, what we're talking about is the art of Christendom, we're looking at the Middle East as the Islamic world. And I think that there is a, they, the two terms are balanced in that respect. But I have to say that from the point of view of um, someone who's, who's, as I said, studied originally uh, the Ottomans, and seeing it from the point of view also of people who study the art of South Asia, Islamic art is a very, limit, of very limited use uh, for many people. And that it's such, it covers such a diversity of traditions um, that we need to use it with um, uh, a certain a raised eyebrow uh, to understand that, that it's, it's a co useful construct that is currently very widely used, as I was talking about the term Middle East. Um, but, for example, using it in South Asia, according to my South Asian um, colleagues, is very divisive, and we should, you know, we try to avoid that when we're dealing with South Asia at the V&A, which is why, you know, now... Uh, for, for, sorry, for historical reasons, we have a separate South Asian section, but I think that, that helps us um, to deal with South Asia and its uh, different populations uh, in an equitable and, uh, way. 
But in the Middle East, it, it, is, has become, it is something which is very useful. And it is noticeable that in Southeast Asia, Islamic art is also um, very much in, in vogue in terms of the founding of museums of Islamic art. So I think I've finished now. Thank you. Gracias. Um, <clears throat> Creo que también sería interesante comentar un poco el caso de la singularidad española. Eh, España es probablemente el único país de Occidente que tiene un arte islámico propio, lo cual eh, no ocurre en otros países eh, que no sean islámicos hoy día. Eh, también es verdad que el arte eh, islámico español es muy escaso. Fuera de España, eh, particularmente, muchos museos tienen dificultad en representar bien eh, el arte califal o el arte nazarí español. Eh, tienen colecciones eh, pequeñas, eh, volviendo al caso del Metropolitan en sus nuevas galerías, tuvieron que llegar a un acuerdo especial con otra institución que les prestara a largo plazo arte eh, islámico español y, y, por lo tanto, es escaso. En las mismas grandes colecciones que se están formando en el Museo de Doha o en Qatar o en Kuwait está bastante escasamente representado y las pocas veces que aparecen piezas eh, de origen español pues obtienen precios eh, siempre muy elevados. Eso quiere decir que lo que tenemos aquí es un bien de gran valor y que, desgraciadamente, no hay ningún museo que se le pueda llamar de arte islámico español. Eh, tenemos pues, el Museo Arqueológico, que se va a reinaugurar dentro de poco con eh, sala importante de arte islámico. Tenemos la Alhambra, obviamente, con su museo, que periódicamente pues, también lo tiene muy presente, pero eh, no hay prácticamente instituciones que estén dedicadas a acumular, a comprar o a formar una colección importante de arte islámico español, ¿por qué? Porque hay poco. Mm, lo mismo pasa en realidad con las exposiciones. Han hecho relativamente pocas exposiciones de arte islámico. Hubo la grande de Al-Andalus en Granada en el año 92, la Alhambra periódicamente monta pues, los jarrones de la Alhambra o distintas exposiciones. Ahora hay la de Nur, pero que también eh, la verdad es que hay, comparado con los bienes que tenemos desde el punto de vista arquitectónico, eh, hay poca presencia por lo demás. Hay los museos provinciales, el Museo de Córdoba, el Museo de Granada, arqueológico, que tienen cosas estupendas, pero quizá pueda parecer que poco puestas en valor o que necesitarían de de una modernización en su presentación y cosas así. Esto nos lleva también al tema del arte islámico contemporáneo, moderno y contemporáneo, que prácticamente yo creo que ninguna institución tiene dentro de su política de compras la idea de acumular sistemáticamente o de formar una colección de arte contemporáneo islámico lo cual es una carencia que, que a través de los años eh, se hará notar y que es una pena, puesto que eh, el capital que tenemos en origen es importante, pues eh, sería muy interesante que de alguna manera hubiera instituciones que mantuvieran ese interés por ese arte y, y mantuviera unas colecciones actualizadas. En fin, yo creo que estas son las reflexiones que se podrían comentar a lo mejor un poquito más y, y en fin… Y las someto así, por lo tanto. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Santiago. Eh, ahora paso la palabra a Guillermo, Guillermo de Osma. Eh, vamos, eh, estamos viendo que hay grandes transformaciones, eh, evidentemente, de naturaleza económica, con la emergencia de, de nuevas zonas eh, importantes en el mundo, como puede ser el Golfo, pero como también puede ser China o América Latina. Eh, vemos que hay, digamos, mercados emergentes de arte, yo diría más que emergentes, emergidos, en lugares como Hong Kong o en Beirut o, evidentemente, en todo alrededor del Golfo. Y todo esto tiene que suponer, evidentemente, una nueva situación en relación con las colecciones, digamos, con, digamos, con las galerías, con las colecciones privadas, con las relaciones entre lo, lo privado y las instituciones públicas. Eh, hoy, eh, como ejemplo, eh, creo que es hoy, eh, el IBAM de Valencia está presentando la exposición eh, Te con Efertiti, que, fue, eh, que en su origen fue producida por el, 
el Museo de Doha, no el de Arte Islámico, sino el, el Museo de Arte Moderno. Eh, precisamente Casa Árabe tuvo oportunidad de servir de nexo entre los comisarios y el IBAM. Y, y insisto, hay mucho movimiento y yo personalmente no sé muy bien cuáles son las consecuencias de ese movimiento. Así que, Guillermo, por favor. Bueno, buenas tardes. Tampoco sé si yo puedo añadir muchísimo más. ¿eh? Mi, mi, mi especialidad es un poco otra, pero es verdad que, eh, primero, eh, enmendarle un poco a mi amigo Santiago el que se olvidara precisamente del museo de mi antecesor y pariente, y eh, tenemos aquí una maravillosa representante, que es el Valencia de Don Juan, donde hay una gran colección de arte islámico, eh, realmente excepcional, eh, de textiles hispano-morescos, absolutamente excepcional, eh, institución que se funda en 1916, pero ya en el año 7, 8, 9, se habla del museo de Don Guillermo, que fue un personaje muy interesante, político, ministro de Hacienda dos veces con Maura, político conservador, pero, pero liberal en el sentido de, de espíritu abierto, curioso, debía tener un genio soberbio, pero eh, que algunos hemos heredado, pero, pero, pero bueno, personaje muy interesante y que deja esta fundación que realmente es extraordinaria y donde hay algunas piezas fantásticas, algunas, por cierto, de la colección de los Fortuni, que es eh, otro, otro amigo personal, digamos, del cual hemos hablado aquí. Y también fue gran coleccionista, por cierto, de arte. Yo creo que antes se llamaba morisco, ¿no? De arte morisco, ¿no? Eh, realmente el término islámico, efectivamente, en España es probablemente mucho más reciente que 1900, ¿no? Eh, o arte árabe, ¿no? O arte del norte de África. Eh, Fortuny Padre fue un grandísimo coleccionista. Subasta una gran parte de su colección en el año 75 y alguna de sus piezas... Eh, acaba en el Valencia de Don Juan, igual que en otros grandes museos del mundo. ¿no? Eh, y volviendo un poco al tema, del, al tema del mercado, yo creo que el concepto tiene mucho que ver también con el mercado, porque es muy cómodo, al final, eh, utilizar el término descriptivo de las nuevas salas del Metropolitan, y a los americanos también hay que entenderles que llamar arte islámico eh, habiendo pasado, el, el, y hay este lado muy político y muy ligado a esta especie de, de, de fundamentalismo eh, que se ha hecho muy presente en todos estos países y que ha complicado tremendamente las cosas, pues obviamente en Estados Unidos quizá no es políticamente muy correcto y han preferido este término más descriptivo para estas nuevas salas, ¿no? Pero está claro que para el mercado es muy cómodo tener un término, para el mercado, para los historiadores, para el visitante, es decir, tener un término corto, eh, muy fácil de, de retener y que se universalice de alguna manera es muy cómodo. Y ahí yo creo que las grandes casas de subastas eh, han hecho mucho para que este nuevo término tenga eh, una fuerza, digamos, como concepto y como categoría de coleccionismo muy importante. Igual que, por ejemplo, han acabado convirtiendo el arte iberoamericano en arte latinoamericano. ¿no? El Latin American es un concepto que viene casi de las casas de subastas, ¿no? las famosas Latin American Sales, las subastas latinoamericanas eh, bianuales que se hacen en Nueva York, desde el año 79-80 han ido marcando y han ido creando un coleccionismo de arte latinoamericano. ¿no? Ya no se habla casi del arte iberoamericano que hemos hablado o hispanoamericano, que en España se ha dicho hasta ahora siempre. ¿no? Eh, y los grandes libros de, 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 de los historiadores españoles eran el arte de Hispanoamérica o el arte hispanoamericano. No se hablaba aquí de arte latinoamericano. Hoy en día es un término que claramente le ha comido el terreno, ¿no? igual que muchos otros, y yo creo que el mercado en eso tiene una enorme importancia. Y cuando eh, todos los países del Golfo, que eran países muy modestos, eh, se enriquecen de una manera tan eh, digamos, dramática y tan, y, tan, y tan potente, con esta potencia brutal de, de, de ser los grandes productores del petróleo, y empiezan a coleccionar, que eso yo creo que es una cosa bastante reciente, Tim me corregirá, pero yo creo que el coleccionismo así en serio es relativamente reciente, eh, eh, pero claro, eso tiene un impacto tremendo en el mercado, tremendo, igual que el arte chino eh, tiene unos precios que no tienen ninguna relación 
con lo que puedan tener muchísimas cosas que están pasando en Occidente en el mismo tiempo, pintores eh, probablemente nos olvidemos de ellos dentro de 20 o 30 años, pues eh, tiene unos precios de, de, de varios millones de euros. ¿no? Y lo mismo está pasando con el arte islámico, ¿no? aparte de que pueda haber un problema de escasez, cosa que no pasa en el arte contemporáneo chino, por ejemplo, eh, pero igual que en el arte chino histórico o en el arte islámico no, no, no contemporáneo, que también, por supuesto, ha pegado una gran subida estos últimos años. De hecho, antes es que ni hablábamos de arte islámico contemporáneo, no, no, lo, no le hacíamos caso. Estaba ahí, por supuesto, pero no le hacíamos ningún caso, porque en cierta parte porque no valía dinero. Y yo creo que ese es un concepto bastante interesante. Yo me acuerdo que siempre me chocó al leer a Quentin Bell, que es un nombre que viene del laborismo inglés, o sea, más bien de la izquierda, decir que el arte existe porque se vende, ¿no? Y yo creo que el arte islámico tiene una presencia enorme porque se vende y se vende muy caro hoy en día, y desde luego el arte contemporáneo, tanto chino como indio, como islámico, como por ejemplo el marroquí, que en estos momentos eh, está también alcanzando grandes precios, pues eh, tiene mucho que ver con, con la venta y con el mercado. ¿no? Yo creo que realmente eso ha cambiado también mucho la percepción, eh, la percepción digamos, universal de, de todo esto y obviamente ha propiciado que ellos mismos sean conscientes de lo que, de lo que su dinero puede hacer y, y, y gracias a Dios lo están empleando en crear en crear cultura, ¿no? o al menos territorios de cultura, como son estos eh, grandes museos en todos estos, en todos estos, sobre todo en el Golfo. ¿no? Y, eh, y bueno, yo, yo sí quería un poco, Tim, preguntarte un poco qué pasa con el lado fundamentalista, es decir, qué concepto tienen los fundamentalistas islámicos, que desgraciadamente están presentes en muchos de todos estos países, ¿Qué concepto tienen de, de, o qué importancia le dan ellos al arte islámico? Y luego, si hay tiempo, yo creo que el tema de la, de la, de la, de la guerra, en el caso, por ejemplo, sirio, eh, o de las revoluciones, en el caso de otros países del norte, de qué impacto ha tenido eso también, obviamente, el lado de, de, del, del destrozo y de, sobre todo en la arquitectura, pues ha debido ser enorme, ¿no? Pero quizás esas dos preguntas en la mesa, si tenemos tiempo, un poco eh, la visión de los fundamentalistas eh, islámicos sobre su propia eh, cultura y su propia creación artística, y dos, un poco el tema de la conservación y de los problemas que ha habido tan tremendos con las convulsiones de, del, del Middle East, ¿no? del, del Próximo Oriente. ¿no? The first question uh, was about um, something that Guillermo posits as fundamentalist art, but actually that term is all, almost, I mean, it's a contradiction in terms, because um, if you look at the views of, uh, you know, fundamentalist is a very loaded term, and a lot, when I spoke about Islamists, of course, this covers a very broad group of political views. Um, of all, a broad range of political views. And if we, so if we put aside the term fundamentalist, if we say, if you're going to be as purist as possible, um, how do you look as a, at, a, as, at art from uh, an Islamic point of view? Well, you can, you know, if you, if you consider that in Wahhabism, for example, for a, as one example, that um, you mustn't distract yourself from um, Think of from prayer, from prayer, from being, uh, from devoting what you're doing to God. Then any form of art um, can be a distraction, and you know that's why uh, the Wahhabis have destroyed tombs and um, any other sort of monuments that can be seen as encouraging idolatry. I mean, they're very strict about it, and so for them, um, art. And in itself would not, you know, if, if art has, a, if arts and architecture, if you can take it broader, have a function, such as, you know, you build an airport and you make it a nice place to be because there's a nice pattern on the wall, that's fine. I mean, they don't, they're not going to have very strong 
theories of, about it, and it may be that um, people like you know the destruction caused by the Taliban in during, um, in their rule in Afghanistan shows that they're willing to destroy things um, which are considered very valuable by people from uh, outside their movement. And it's been suggested by one of, um, uh, put forward in a quite coherent case by one of uh, my colleagues, that actually they're not that bothered about these things, but they, that they did it specifically to irritate um, Western society and uh, uh, Western newspapers and everything. So you blow up a Buddha in order to irritate your enemies, not because you are them yourself uh, committed to destroying every work of art. But we saw what, you know, I, it's very difficult to talk about what's happened in Syria. Um, I, I have seen film of the destruction of works of art, works of art being hauled off from monuments, uh, you know, presumably sell on the international market. But what we do know is that um, one of the most important monuments of uh, Syria is the 11th century minaret of the great mosque of uh, uh, Aleppo, and that, that art from the period of the Umayyad rule in the 7th and 8th century went to produce monuments such as the Great Mosque of Damascus. There's a hiatus um, until the late 11th century when the Seljuks arrive, and they commissioned this minaret. And so it's extremely important in rep and the being the beginning of art and architecture in Syria in the uh, middle and later Middle Ages, and it was blown up. So it's completely destroyed. So we can see from that example that um, what we consider art and architecture has been destroyed. And also, uh, we know that enormous damage has been done to uh, cityscapes, such as the, um, the souk of Aleppo, which is, which is burnt down. Quite, I mean, some people have, uh, tell me that large parts of it have actually been destroyed uh, in the fire. So um, surely there have been problems with the museums and the change of security. And we've seen that also, for example, in Iraq, when the museums and libraries were looted. And what that tells us is not that these, that these people are barbaric, but that they were never given any share in the state apparatus that maintained the museums. They saw, the, they, in a way that we hope it will, will occur everywhere, where people will learn to enjoy and value their museums as a source of education and maybe a source of identity, then that never happened. That from you know, the period of British rule in Iraq, museums were established, but especially for the, um, for the, for the Shiite major majority in the country who were um, excluded from a, the major, you know, education and economic opportunities, for those people, they were never taught anything about these institutions, and they didn't understand them, and they saw them merely as part of the apparatus of the state. So they attacked them after uh, the invasion. So, and th so these are the, the sorts of things that have occurred there, and I think they're um, part of the uh, um, they're, they're part of the uh, problem in uh, some Middle Eastern states that have not uh, built. Um, a education system and an and, um, e e inclusive economic system. And, um, you know, the same thing happened, it seems, in Egypt after the, the Arab Spring Revolt in 2011, that many, uh, that, that for a time, uh, control of archaeological sites broke down and we see, uh, you know, a lot of looting took place. I've, I've seen a picture from Taken from the Air of the great city of Apamea in Syria, and the whole site is pockmarked with the illegal excavations of people looking for antiquities to sell. I mean, it's, you know, since the 20s or 30s, the Belgians and the Syrians have been carefully, step by step, excavating the site of Apamea. The Belgians have helped to turn it into a tourist venue because they've re-erected part of the central uh, colonnade that went along the main streets of the Roman, uh, the Hellenistic and Roman city. And all of that work has, is in the future has been completely disrupted by an enormous number of people going and looking for antiquities on the site. So it, it's very sad and um, uh, this is, you know, but can, can, this has to be put beside also, you know, it's just an add-on to the terrible human cost that's been um, 
suffered in those countries. Um, have I answered your two questions? Yeah, thanks. Can I, can I say, can I make one comment though, which is that we, we you know, I'm the organizer of the Jamil Prize, and so I had to, f to face up to these questions, which is, what on earth do you call the contemporary art of the Middle East? And I have to say that we always avoid the term Islamic art, that we use Islamic art up until the First World War, and we don't use it for the period afterwards. And that, I mean, that's one of these grand decisions that may, is made externally by um, a foreign institution. But it does, it's, it's our way of coping with the very diverse nature of the region and the fact that um, if, if somebody from the Middle East or South Asia wants to call their art Islamic art, we're not objecting to that. But what we must be careful to do is not to foist terms onto people who actually don't think they're, they're, that their production is Islamic art. So that's why we, we're very happy with terms like contemporary art of the Middle East and that sort of thing. So it is a bit unclear as to when Islamic art ends and whether the art produced in the region today or by Middle Eastern artists and architects who live outside the region. I mean, in London, our great example is Zaha Hadid, um, the architect. Um, so that's, you know, these are, and I think we have to be very soft over where the boundaries come in contemporary art, unless the artists actually tell us that that's where, you know, they make a statement of their identity. Sí, antes de pasar a las preguntas y respuestas, eh, yo quería hacer dos preguntas a, a Tim Stanley y un comentario más general a, a lo que nos dijo Guillermo. Por otro lado, destacar, yo creo que si Santiago Saavedra no se refirió al Instituto de Valencia de Don Juan, era para dejar la oportunidad a Guillermo de Osma que lo hiciera. Perdona, aprovecho un segundito solo para decir que el Valencia de Don Juan es la joya de la corona. ¿Eh? Lo que pasa es que muy discreta y, y, y lo más coherente de todo lo que tenemos por mucho. No, al respecto, una simple anécdota en la que nadie vea más de, de la anécdota. Precisamente cuando se inauguró en Sevilla la exposición NUR, hay al menos una pieza, yo no, creo que hay más, cinco piezas, eh, diez piezas. Sí, sí, no, pero digo, es que me refiero a una en concreto. Digo, hay una pieza que dice proveniente del de Instituto Valencia de Don Juan. Entonces, eh, había una señora que dijo, mira, esta pieza viene de Valencia. Entonces, digo, que nadie vea más allá de ello, eh, simplemente esta anécdota. Las dos, preguntas, eh, eh, las dos preguntas, la primera pregunta es, eh, ¿en qué medida, eh, y esto tiene que ver con lo que también Guillermo dijo sobre... Eh, digamos, hablando mal y pronto, la primavera árabe, ¿en qué medida el hecho de que después, y en parte también Tim ha abordado esta cuestión, que después de la revolución iraní de 1979 y la ruptura con todo el periodo anterior, llegaran numerosos eh, intelectuales, es decir, más que llegaran, ya estaban de alguna manera instalados, pero ya se quedaron allí, en, en Londres, que hubiera una gran cantidad de... Eh, de iraníes no está haciendo también que de alguna manera se conforme esta noción de, de arte eh, islámico en el sentido de que en el momento en que las eh, petromonarquías del Golfo y sus sociedades están empezando a adquirir arte nos encontramos me parece a mí de manera desproporcionada en Londres con una gran cantidad de intermediarios de todo sentido intelectuales pero también galeristas o, o en general eh, profesores, etcétera, en instituciones como la School of Oriental Art, eh, eh, School of African and, um, African, eh, Oriental and African Studies y otras instituciones, el Instituto del Medio Oriente, por ejemplo. Es decir, ¿en qué medida no estamos también ante un hecho de que eh, la mayor parte de los intelectuales eh, que se encuentran en Londres en realidad provienen de, este, de, de Irán? Eh, debo decir que a nosotros nos sorprendió, a mí no me sorprendió excesivamente habiendo residido en Irán, pero una de las sorpresas del de, eh, año pasado cuando presentamos el, el premio Yamil es que aproximadamente el 50% de, las, eh, de, de los eh, eh, artistas o bien eran iraníes o bien provenían de familias iraníes instaladas en, eh, en Canadá, en Estados Unidos, etcétera. 
Esa es la primera pregunta. La segunda pregunta es, eh, cuando uno va al Museo de Arte Islámico de Doha y se fija específicamente en la cuestión de España o de las piezas viniendo de España, uno llega a la sensación de que se está tratando de duplicar el museo, por ejemplo, el Museo de Medina Zahara. Es decir, da la sensación, aunque eh, insisto y quiero decir que es una sensación porque uno no se dedica a contar que si en Medina Zahara hay siete capiteles, en el Museo de Arte Islámico de Doha hay siete capiteles. Que si hay una celosía, hay una celosía. ¿Es esta impresión, yo diría, correcta por lo que se refiere al caso español? Y sobre todo, si es de ser correcta, si es generalizable. Es decir, este tipo de instituciones, de alguna manera, están tratando de duplicar, de hacer, en el mejor sentido de la palabra, una copia, pero sobre todo de hacer un espejo. ¿Y en qué medida es eh, ello producto de las galerías no, perdón, no de las galerías, sino de las, eh, de las, eh, aux, eh, de las subastas de Socebis o de Cristis, o ellas son simplemente un instrumento de la compra. Después haré el comentario, un comentario a Guillermo. Um, I think that the, uh, there, were, there were several questions there. Um, there was one about Iranians in London, and certainly, the, I think probably there are f there are less there were fewer Iranians in London than there are Turks, for example. But those Iranians came um, starting f well before the revolution, but certainly there was a number arrived after the revolution of 1979, and um, they have been many of them have been very successful in business. And they are, they are, in a mild and uh, normal way, they're nationalists. And they, they love their country that they're in exile from, and they're very proud of their culture. And so we, we actually have something called the Iran Heritage Foundation, which is based in London, which is very successful at promoting Iranian culture there. And so even though we have, um, uh, we have a, muse a museum where we have an, museum, an Islamic Middle East gallery, which has the name Jamil Gallery of Islamic Art. And although I told that story about Munir um, thinking it must be, an, it's beautiful, so it must be Iranian, there, is, uh, there, there hasn't been the same uh, ad, uh, agitation against the, this term. And that's partly because the V&A has many other galleries and many other collections where Iran is represented. And we, I have to say that we have been the, um, the received uh, a great deal of very useful sponsorship from the Iran Heritage Foundation, who we are a corporate, corporate partner with. And so um, that's something that um, uh, is not, does not exist, for example, in terms of the Turkish community. There is no overall um, body which represents uh, t uh, Turkish culture and wants to do it Um, in, with the museum, for example, although that is possible in the future. And of course, we, um, we have a great r relationship with um, an, an Arab patron um, who has been sponsoring that. Am I answering your question a little? Yes. Yeah. So, it's, you know, there are many Iranians in London, but they didn't make the trouble that um, they made in New York about the name, but that's because they didn't pay for it, they, and they understand that. Uh, the Jamils paid for it, and they, they were happy with it being called the Islamic Art Uh, d department of the of the museum. Um, perhaps you could remind me if what the, the second question is: uh, the mirror, uh, if they are buying mirroring. Uh, oh yes, well it is. It is. It's quite an interesting thing because the I was saying that the the type of collecting that's taken place by people from the Middle East or or who of <coughs> of Middle Eastern heritage and live elsewhere has you've seen a change in the type of, the broad category has actually changed in, since the 1970s. And, uh, you know, the, the Kuwait Museum was one of the first uh, collections to show that, but also, for example, the Khalili collection, where, although the collector is actually Jewish, he's a Jew from Iran, and he, under, he understands, as a, someone who's been a dealer in Islamic art in the past, he understands the category very well, and created something uh, quite amazing. And um, the... Uh, the question then is, what, when, when, the peop when people set up museums in the, in the Middle East, um, 
what framework were they using? And I think that there are, that this is actually changing. That at the beginning, they, their contacts would be more with the auction houses. And the auction houses and, uh, have people who, running them who are uh, very knowledgeable about the art that they're dealing in and can actually advise uh, their clients about what to buy you know, in, in a, um, with, with the knowledge that, of course, they're promoting the, the material that they're, they're trying to sell. But it's still, I, I, I learned a lot from them. And um, the reason that I shifted from being an Ottoman historian to being uh, someone involved with Islamic art is, in fact, that, that London is the great clearinghouse for this, in this area. And therefore, I was... Um, I was taught things by working in auction houses, so that's that's part of my background. But the um, I think that maybe we, you could accuse the uh, the golf collectors at the beginning of mimicking what was going on. I have to say that I think in the case of the Spanish collection at, um, at, at in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, I think it shows a particular sensitivity of Arabs um, of a certain you know, with a certain education, where they actually very much like the art of uh, Iberia, of, the, of Al Andalus, um, because it refers to a lost world um, that was uh, a great producer of, of uh, cultural artifacts, of poetry and uh, of buildings that still exist. And of course, if you, if you think about it, one, there's, there's really very few medieval palaces that survive in working use in the Middle East. Um, if you can, the Top Gapi Palace is just about medieval because it was founded in the 1450s, at the end of the 1450s, but almost everywhere else, because of when dynastic change took place, um, the, the building of the previous, the, the palaces of the previous dynasty were either neglected or actually knocked down to build a new one. There's actually very little left, and the Alhambra is actually the you know, the, a very, very important building because it shows us, because Charles V uh, turned it into um, a symbol of his, uh, of his grandparents' triumph, then uh, it's been preserved in an unusual way and it is very, very important for telling us about what medieval pa um, palaces were like. And of course, there has to be a great deal of work on that in order to, to use texts um, to understand, and also to use archaeology to show what the palace looked like in the past, but also to use text um, to show uh, how it was used in the past and what it meant to contemporaries. So, and that's been done by Spaniards. And I think it's an in, uh, you know, I, it's one of the most wonderful lectures I've been to, uh, for example, on, um, by Fernanda Fuertas, on uh, the parties that were held in the Alhambra uh, that is given in London. I, and so I think that we're beginning to understand how it worked. So. I've gone off the point slightly, but I'm saying that the, bu the buildings themselves are very, very important, and um, uh, I think they should be, ex you know, uh, it is, you have some of the most important products of Arab architectural genius in your country, and very happily, for, for different reasons, you've preserved them by turning them to cathedrals or into um, uh, palaces, uh, sort of exotic settings for, for your kings in the 16th century. And of course, that, that contrasts in other areas which have been reconquered from Muslim powers. For example, if you go, go to, to the Balkans, um, which were under Islamic rule for many centuries, uh, they've systematically destroyed 90% of uh, the, Isla the Ottoman buildings in the Balkans. Rather, and for example, if you go to Thessalonica, um, you see the, uh, the fantastic Byzantine churches, but you don't see the, um, the, 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 architect, the architectural and um, the urban context in which they existed, in which they survived over the intermediate, intervening centuries because um, the, the city has been destroyed. Everything's been knocked down unless it was actually Byzantine. And I find, apart from the walls, for example. And I think that's very up, that's upsetting because I think that the Thessalonians have thrown away um, something that would be a, um, a fantastic thing for people to visit. It would add enormously to the um, economic vibra vibrancy of the city now if they had preserved it. But of course, 
You can, um, you can imagine the, the reasons why it was destroyed, but that hasn't happened so much in Spain. I mean, it was a long time ago. People didn't destroy buildings quite so quickly uh, when, they, when, they, when their, their value was comparatively greater in the, in, the, um, in the economy. And so you have preserved those, and I think that's a really important thing that you can develop in the future. And um, the, uh, that, the glamour of those buildings and of the poetry that went with them um, actually has created something in the uh, 20th and 21st century Arab, educated Arab mind, which is this lost world. And they, they therefore love to own things which come from there. I mean, I, I, think, I don't want to go too far with this because I seem to be sort of, dis, sort of uh, attributing to people something they can very well talk about themselves. And I think, but I think that is the, that uh, yes, they will have collected Spanish Islamic art because the museums like the V&A own it, but also I think they, they also bought it because they like it. And in fact, you know, in Doha, they have fantastic objects. They have the, you know, beautiful curtain uh, and many other metal objects and um, they, they've created, and ivories, and they've created something, um, they've brought together something because of their incredible resources that uh, I, I, re I mean, I, I find very, very uh, rewarding when I've been there. And the, um, so I think we've, we've started with um, a model of what Islamic art is, which is inherited from other, um, uh, from outside the region, from the museums elsewhere. They want to have their equivalent of it. But I think there are ways in which it changes because of the tastes and preferences of the collectors. And then I think that, that things are changing because um, they want... Uh, the people running institutions like this want the institutions to mean more to the local population. And they're seeking ways of uh, highlighting the production of their own region. And for example, the, in the Venice, Venice Biennale, uh, now you have uh, repre representation from the United Arab Emirates. And so they, although they um, can point to uh, cultural activities in the, 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 their region before the 1970s, um, they were really very low, but of course as the, as, the region, as the country has become much richer, vastly rich, on the basis of oil and gas, then they've, um, this has been given greater opportunity to their populations, and you actually see the emergence of um, Emirati artists, and that those, those people are being represented to the international pro uh, public as something which belongs to them. And I think there's a change in the attitude towards is, uh, is, you know, Islamic art as a category, that they, they will take more and more control of it. It's a transition. Sí, el, el comentario brevemente que, bueno, la pregunta precisamente sobre el fundamentalismo, eh, o, digamos, los fundamentalistas, y yo creo que hay que tener en cuenta que, sobre todo en el Golfo, pero en otros países árabes, Coinciden muchas veces eh, elementos o sensibilidades de, de una parte y de otra en las mismas instituciones. Uno ve instituciones en estos países como muy descentralizadas, donde un instituto o un museo eh, está a la vanguardia del arte y otro instituto otro museo, obedeciendo a la misma cúpula, está precisamente a veces combatiendo contra, contra ese, ese digamos, esos planteamientos. ¿no? Hay como una descentralización, parece que eh, en el fondo consiste en poner no todos los huevos en la misma cesta. ¿no? Hay un o, esa es una explicación, otra explicación es que las múltiples tensiones en la propia sociedad acaban encontrando vehículos diferentes de carácter institucional. Otro debate, que no es el momento por la hora, es eh, precisamente en qué medida el hecho de tener en algunos países de la zona artes de vanguardia no está poniendo en contradicción también con la propia estructura social en la que se encuentra. Es decir, hay numerosos artistas en países como Qatar o Emiratos Árabes que centran parte o una gran parte de su obra en la visibilidad de los trabajadores que no se ven en la calle. Es decir, eh, pero insisto, ese es otro, eh, ese es otro debate.